Okay. Okay, beautiful. I hate talking in front of people. <laughs> um, okay, so obviously I sent an email. I told you guys that I graded assignment one. Um, overall, you guys did really well. Um, there was just obviously like recurring mistakes. Um, and some of you have asked me if you could like ask like to see what you could do better for assignment two. So kind of put this together to show you what the common mistakes were and then what you can do. Um, so the biggest mistakes I noticed in almost every single one was um, in-text citations and then the reference page. So either some people just lacked it all together or they had like one or the other. Um, some people had it but they did it incorrectly. Um, so obviously you're going to lose points accordingly with that. Um, in APA, your citations and your reference page are important. Obviously, you don't want to like get caught with like plagiarism or anything. Even if like you don't use the exact words, you still like summarize it a little bit, put it in your own words. You still want to make sure that whoever you got the information from is getting like like credit for it. Um, so that was the biggest issue. Um, here I have an example of like what the in-text citation and what your reference page should look like. So obviously, um, in-text citation has the last name and then the date of publication after it. And you always want to put it after whatever like quotation you make. Um, your APA reference page should always say references, not works cited or like bibliography or anything, because that's MLA, not APA. Um, and then obviously, you have um, the authors first, the date of publication, the title of whatever work you're citing. And then if it was on like a specific like web page or like a journal or something, then you'll put the journal after that. Um, and if it was a website, you'll have like the URL or if it was a book, you have like the DOI and stuff. Um, but this is gonna be in the beginning of um, the lecture slides, obviously. So if you like wanna refer back to this at any point, obviously you're more than welcome to. Um, and then I have later on that um, Purdue has a lot of like examples and stuff for this. So it's always easy to just go back and like look at it. Um, some more common mistakes, answer length. Um, question four where you had to connect specific um, like research studies to the article that you read. That typically would be the longest one. Um, so if you've only wrote like a couple sentences, um, obviously it's not going to give enough like information as well as the summary. Some people wrote way too much, some people wrote way too little. Um, my suggestion for like the summary part is that if just pretend that somebody's reading what you wrote that hasn't watched like the article or I mean, read the article or like watched the video um, that way they really know like what exactly happened that's why we mentioned like just make sure you put in the, like the key points and stuff um, and then again like I have research from the textbook a lot of people didn't put any research in the textbook so that took away a lot of points because that was like really the big focus. Um, I'm trying to think of like a specific thing I can mention about that, but I can't think of it right now. If I think of it, I'll mention it. Um, so then advice for assignment two, just make sure that you read each question like thoroughly and answer them thoughtfully. And um, that kind of goes back to what I was saying about question four. A lot of people had a lot of issues with that one. Um, and then, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I guess I just felt like some people rushed really, like rushed through like their answers and like just didn't pay attention to what exactly we were asking. That's why we have like the actual question and like the rubric so you can really like follow along and like know what we're looking for. Um, and then referring back to the citations and stuff since that was like the biggest issue. Um, just use a Purdue website. Um, Scribbler sometimes has good like um, explanations on how to do things. And then if you still are having an issue with it, I have an example of an APA paper. Um, so I can always email that too if you want. But that was pretty much it. I don't know if anybody had any questions. I can answer them now maybe. Anybody on the Zoom either? Not too sure. But other than that, I mean, that's pretty much it. But like I said, if you have any questions, you can email me. If you have any questions about your grade, um, I can try to explain how I graded it. But like I said in the email, um, on the feedback, like turn it in thing, I tried to explain like why I was like taking points away. 
or like if you did well, like I told you you did well, like that kind of thing. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So. How many of you have used APA before? Just you? Uh, what do you guys use? MLA? MLA. Okay, so it's kind of similar. Um, it's just a different uh, citing way for psychology. It's very simple. You can just follow the Purdue link. I think they have that, right? Do they have the Purdue link? Hmm? The Purdue link. Okay. Yep. Uh, it will tell you each step what to do. It's very similar to MLA. Um, also, I embedded a link here on this slide. You can go to. There's a app called Mentally. It's free. You can use it for any kind of citation. It can be APA, MLA. Do you know the auto citation thing online? Sometimes you can just put in the names and stuff, and it generates that. Um, the link that I put here, the Mendeley link, that's the most formal one, and it's free. So uh, use that. I also, I also put the link for how to use it on this slide. Go use that. In the future, if you need to use MLA, you can use that software as well. It's uh, very convenient. Okay. So today we are starting chapter seven, and we're gonna talk about memory. Uh, there'll be a lot to cover. If you have any questions throughout, just let me know. So memory, this is an active system that receives information from the census, puts it into a useful form, and organizes as it stores. At the end, it allows us to retrieve information from storage. Memory gives us the ability to take in, solidify, store, and use information. So this is very important. This helps to make up who we are. If you lose your memory, you're not the same person anymore, right? So memory is very important. Memory processing, uh, we have three processes uh, in total. First is encoding. So that's when we take in new information and put it into memory. After consolidation, we go to the second process, uh, is the storage. So that's when we stabilize and store our memory. The last step of the process is retrieval. So we uh, recover and try to use that memory. And next, we are going to talk about encoding in more details. So encoding, this is uh, when the information is put into memory. Uh, we have memory codes. Those are the mental representation of physical stimuli when encoded into memory. We have three types of memory codes. First, we have the acoustic. Uh, that's when we code the information as sound. Second is the visual memory codes. That's those information as uh, images. And last, we have the semantic memory codes. And those would be information as general meanings. For example, when I say pen, you know what that means. That will be semantic. Any questions so far? Yes? Is there one, like, um, does touch fall into one, like recognizing how something feels like? Uh, nope. nope. Okay. So our attention drives the encoding process. If we are not paying attention, uh, we are less likely to encode those information. So you might sense it, but you might not encode it. 
Now I'm going to show you a demonstration. So for the hold on, give me one second. So for the left side of the class, you guys will be group one, and I want you to close your eyes for now. For group two, on the right side of the class, read the following instruction in your head. Don't read it out loud. Once you get the instruction, give me a thumbs up. Uh, all right. student, I forgot. Forgot about you guys. Uh, you can assign yourself to be either group one or group two, uh, based on your preferences. Okay, group one, keep your eyes closed. You guys, uh, just take a couple seconds to write down your answers. Once you're done, close your eyes. Uh, group one, you can open your eyes now. Okay, so group two, close your eyes. Uh, for group one, in your head, read the instructions. Once you got it, give me a thumbs up. All right. Okay. And group two, you can open your eyes now. We're gonna just wait for a group one to write down their answers. So, how many did you remember? Group one. You can just say it. Three, three, four, three, one, three. Group two, how many did you guys remember? Three, five, four, three, five, two, three. Okay. So, the most here will be four, and the most here will be five, right? We don't have enough participants, but if we have more, it will show uh, that group one will remember this better. And I'm going to show you why. So you have the same list. Uh, they are all the same terms. However, I asked group one to think of a uh, different instruction than you guys. For group two, they saw this instruction. So they need to estimate the number of vowels found in the word. For group one, their instruction is mentally rate the usefulness of the item from one to five if you are stranded on a desert island. So here, uh, it will be easier for you to remember if you have a situation, right? Do I need to explain why, or it's pretty self-explanatory? Okay, good. So this is uh, based on the levels of processing theory. Uh, you don't need to remember the names and year, just there. So memory is the result of processing information. This is what this theory suggests. So we focus. Uh, this theory focuses on the depth of processing involved in memory, and it thinks that the deeper information is processed, the longer a memory trace will last. And according to this theory, there are two types of processing. First, we have the shallow processing. Uh, this process is made by menace rehearsal. So we repeat to 
keep information active. And this is good for short-term memory, but not for long-term memory. Ooh. OK. You got it? Yeah. I to give you one time. OK. The second one will be the deep processing. And this is through elaborative rehearsal. It involves more meaningful analysis of information for better recall, such as the visual imagery encoding. So you store information by co converting the information into mental pictures. Organizational encoding is when you use the relationships among a series of items. And mnemonics, this is when you use a combination of encoding technique to help enhancing memory. I will show you examples for each, so you don't need to try to understand it now. It's a little bit abstract. But do you get the difference between shallow processing and deep processing? Should we look at short-term memory, long-term memory, kind of? No. So shallow processing is when you are merely repeating the information, try to remember it. And deep processing is you're trying to find meanings to remember. So it's not just repetition. Okay. Does that make sense? You guys? Okay. So next it will be an example for visual imagery encoding. I'm U.S. memory champion, Nelson Dellis. Most of you probably use one of these to handle your daily memory storage. But before electronic memories, or even paper and pen, people had to keep a lot more up here. Learning memory techniques is not only the key to remembering things, but a great way to improve your overall brain fitness as well. To demonstrate, we've enlisted a group of volunteers to challenge Nelson's memory. All right, now, do I know any of you? No. No, right? Okay, good. So there's no planning here. So what I want you each to do is say, a random animal name, and uh, we'll go around in the loop, and you'll each do it two times. Think he can memorize a list of 20 animals in perfect order? Play along and see how many you can remember. Starting with you, what's the first animal? Hedgehog. Hedgehog, okay. Aardvark. Aardvark. Tiger. Tiger. Flamingo. Flamingo. Penguin. Penguin. Panda. Okay. Horse. Deer. Okay. Polar bear. Lamb. Salamander. Salamander. Dog. Okay. Ladybug. Go ahead. Pigeon. Pigeon. Elephant. Yeah. Lion. Okay. Rooster. Baboon. Donkey. Donkey. Whoa! Let me just make sure I have it. Before Nelson tries to recall all 20 animals, it's time to flex your memory muscles. We'll even show you the full list one time to help spark your memory. Got it? Okay, try to remember all 20 animals and say them out loud. So, how are you doing? Did you get the first four or five and then fizzle out? That's okay. No one could possibly memorize a list of 20 random animals. Or could they? Starting with the first word, um, so hedgehog, aardvark, tiger, flamingo, penguin, panda, horse, deer, polar bear, lamb, salamander, dog, ladybug, pigeon, elephant, lion, rooster, baboon, donkey, and wolf. Pretty amazing, right? But the truly amazing thing is that Nelson's memory is no better than yours. He's just using a powerful memory-enhancing technique that you can learn as well. So what's his secret? Each time you guys said two animals, I turned that into a vivid picture. So when you said penguin, which is black and white, and the panda, which is also black and white, I imagine them just kind of having like a dinner, proper dinner. <laughs> so by using vivid imagery like this, Nelson was able to boost his memory. And believe it or not, so can you. Take a look at this random list of objects. You could try to memorize this list by reading it over and over. Or try imagining this. The barn caught fire, and the dog saved the sleeping boy by dragging him by his pants to the mailbox. Now, take a moment to burn that scene into your brain. Okay, what were those five items we listed? 
Chances are you remembered all of them. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the example of visual imagery encoding, and you can use it for uh, learning as well. Next, this will be an example for organizational coding. Uh, I think the guy is from Switzerland, so the accent could be a little bit thick, maybe thicker than mine. <laughs> if you don't understand, that's fine. Uh, just try to get a sense what this is. I think I put a, um, the um, I mean the subtitles here, but I don't remember. I'm now going to memorize the order in a shuffle deck of cards. Uh, and while I've done that, uh, or after I've done that, I'm going to, um, to sort this deck, which is already in the original order, into the same order as the one that I just memorized, hopefully. And then I'll compare both of them to see if I were correct or not. Let's give it some more shuffling. You got the idea, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I, I actually went to YouTube and get their automatic uh, subtitles and then that's how I understood it. All right, so see ya in the other end of the memory palace. All right, so let's see if they were all correct. Okay, so that's an example of organi organizational encoding. Uh, it's very difficult, but it's much better than trying to memorize things in random order, right? And if you want, you can also try to practice that. So what he used was a method called memory palace. The memory palace is a technique. And I'm gonna show you uh, like the simple explanation of what this means. The memory palace is a technique to remember facts, numbers, or other things, like a shopping list. It has been around since ancient times and is also known as the method of Loki. Memory champion Marwin Wallonius used it to remember, in just 30 minutes, the correct order of 5,040 binary digits, and a complete deck of 52 cards in just 33 seconds. Here is how it works. Close your eyes and imagine some sort of familiar physical space, like your house, school, or office, and then add a mental image of the thing you want to remember. To remember a bunch of things, you can use different rooms and visualize how you would walk through that space following the same specific route. As you walk through, place the things you want to remember at specific locations. Ideally, imagining things in a funny or crazy way also helps to remember. Once we have placed all items that we want to remember, our memory palace is complete. 
The day we return to our palace and want to remember what's inside it, we have to go back in. We have to concentrate and imagine opening the door and walking our route. Once we pass by the specific location that we use to place our thing, the item will pop back into our minds. Let's try to remember seven ingredients to make some pancakes. 1. You open the door and see a full cup of flour next to some shoes. 2. You walk into the bedroom. Inside your bed sleeps a teaspoonful of baking powder. 3. In the living room sits a massive egg watching TV. 4. And on top of the TV is a cup of milk. 5. You go into the kitchen and see six teaspoons dancing around a bottle of vegetable oil. 6. You leave the house and enter the garden. But it's full of sugar canes and in the middle, a teaspoon dressed like a gardener. 7. You turn around to check the bathroom. The only thing left is half a teaspoon and salt. Now try yourself. Close your eyes and think of a familiar place, such as your home. We will now slowly list seven numbers. As you walk through your space, place each one in a different location. Let's go. Three. Fourteen. One. Five. Nine. Two. Six. Now revisit your palace, then write in the comments below what you can remember. By the way, if you want to memorize pi or something else for a longer time, forget this technique, turn off your screen and start. Nothing beats learning by doing. Alright, you get the idea how this works, right? Memory palace. Uh, this is also shown in a lot of TV shows. But they, sometimes, sometimes they, they don't, don't really explain how it works, but now, now you know, if you did it. This is an uh -huh. example for mnemonics. How many of you are a chemistry major? No one? Okay, so this is not going to be useful, but you get the idea what mnemonics means. And now, ASAP Science presents the elements of the periodic table. There's hydrogen and helium, then lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon everywhere, nitrogen all through the air, with oxygen so you can breathe, and fluorine for your pretty teeth, neon to light up the sign, sodium for salty times, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, then sulfur, chlorine, then argon, potassium, and calcium so you'll grow strong, scandium, titanium, vanadium, and chromium. Okay, so that was combining, that was combining a lot of techniques to remember the periodic table, right? Uh, trust me, this is much easier to remember um, the lyrics of the song than try to remember the table by itself. Uh, unfortunately, no one is a chemistry major, so that's not going to be I had to learn them for high school. Okay, cool. All right, so this is a level of processing theory, what it looks like. Um, so it goes from shallow to deep low to high probability of recall and we have structural uh, nonic and semantic people, people are more likely to remember if it's uh meaningful to us okay so that's why semantic is in the deeper processing and you're more likely to recall it if it's meaningful to you so Next, let's do a question together. Lee is memorizing letters in a psych experiment. He reads the letter B, C, T, but later remembers them as D, C, V. Lee probably used what encoding when he memorized the letters? Auditory. Auditory. B. I 
was weird. Okay. All right. So it's auditory. Next, we are going to talk about storage and some part of consolidation. So consolidation, this is when we stabilize and solidify a memory. And in this process, our neural networks are strengthened. And this could be considered a part of encoding or storage. That's why it's in between on the process. So we found that sleep helps consolidating memories. And if you remember, we mentioned this before, so we found that people remember words better after sleep. Okay, so that's consolidation. Next, we have storage. This is when the information is modified in the brain for easier storage. And we have the information processing model. In this model, we have three stages. So first, we have the sensory memory. Second, we have the short-term memory. And sometimes, some psychologists will say this is also the more working memory. But I think working memory is a little bit different than short-term memory. But they're kind of overlapping. So I will explain that a little bit in the future slides. Lastly, we have the long-term memory. Each stage has a different capacity and duration. And you need to know that the three stages in information processing model is different from the three steps of process that we just talked about. It's a little bit confusing right now if it's your first time hearing about it, but when you go back, it will make sense. Okay. So based on the information processing model, uh, we have this graph to help you remember. So first we have our external stimuli. Your sensory input goes in, and then it becomes your sensory memory. Any unattended information is lost. So if you're not paying uh, pay attention to those information, they will not become sensory memory. After the sensory memory, uh, with attention, it will become short-term memory. In, the, in your short-term memory, the unrehearsed information is lost. So you can only hold it for a short period of time. If you have... Speaker test. Testing speaker, test, test, testing speaker. Oh, that's annoying. I don't know if they can hear me. <coughs> uh, so here, short-term memory. After the maintenance rehearsal, you can keep your short-term memory for a longer period of time. After that, your short-term memory is you repeat it long enough, your neural connection becomes strong enough, it becomes long-term memory. In your long-term memory, you don't remember them at the moment, but once I ask you a question, you can retrieve that, it goes back to your short-term memory. And some information may be lost over time. Does that make sense, this graph? Okay, good. So sensory memory, this is uh, the impressions of sensory information after the original stimuli have ended, and this is the shortest term of memory. The encoding process uh, for sensory memory is your information from your five senses into your sensory registers. And you remember the five senses that we have, right? And then the second step of the process will be storage. Um, our capacity for sensory memory is extremely large. Uh, we don't really know how much we can store for sensory memories, but we know it's huge. The duration is relatively short, about two seconds. For our iconic, which is visual memories, it only lasts less than one second, so maybe half a second. For echoic, 
which is also called auditory memory. This is about two to four seconds. The last step in the sensory memory process is that if intended, sensory memories are sent to the short-term memory, otherwise they fade very quickly. And this requires our selective attention. This controls what information will be processed further or what information is filtered out, which is ignored by us. So the duration for a sensory memory is very short, but I'm going to show you an example, uh, a rare example that uh, it's someone who can hold their sensory memory for a long period of time. And you can see the capacity for sensory memory is huge. I'm Stephen Wiltshire. I'm an artist. I'm in New York City. New York is my favorite city. Stephen is an autistic, artistic savant. I think drawing for Stephen is like air and water for us. He cannot live without it. I'm Stephen's sister. I'm extremely proud of him. I'm going to do a drawing of New York City from the memory. I feel excited. It's a beautiful city. Lots of uh, skyscrapers. My favourite is uh, the Empire State Building. It's a brilliant building. It was so beautiful out there. Nice and sunny. Every aspect of what he sees comes alive on paper. So this morning I figure it out. We'll start with the Brooklyn, up to the Midtown Manhattan, all the way to Queens. Gonna start now. I would love to be in his mind to actually see how he sees things. Stephen was mute until the age of five. So drawing was um, a form of his speech. This was his language. He has a phenomenal memory and is able to memorize cityscapes, landscapes, how many windows, floors, chimneys. To watch the ink touch the paper, it's almost like fine embroidery you can actually see it develop. I never get tired of it. This is it, it's done now. So I feel happy and good. I'm very proud of my work. It's purely Stephen's own determination that he is where he is today. Do the best you can and never stop. Isn't it crazy how much information we can store in our sensory information? Uh, so, I don't think we have much time to discuss, but Quick question, do you think that we have the same ability as him? No? I think so. So do you think it's like a trade-off? Have you heard um, a lot of autistic kids or adults, they are also genius in some other area, but they're not capable of taking care of themselves, lack social skill. 
So you think it might be a trade-off. So they lose some capacity of the brain, and then they have like a other. Um, so, so yeah, this is very interesting. Um, some people they think that we all have that capacity uh, to do the same thing that other people do. It's not like their brain is so different than us, but other people think, yeah, they are trading some other features in their life to get this ability. It's something that you can think about. I think it's, uh, it's very interesting. So let's do a practice together. So try to remember the following numbers. Okay, I'm gonna show you very quickly. What was it? Okay. Okay. You got it? What was it? Okay. What was it? Three seven six five four. Oh, you're lost. six, five, four. Okay. All right. Next. Ready? Six, seven, four, one, eight. So, less confident. Yes. Okay. What about this one? Four, four, zero, 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 all right, next. Okay. How many of you got it? I, I missed the last two. Okay. All right, I think I, we have a couple more. Oh, God. Okay. Oh. You didn't get it? How many of you got it? No. How many of you didn't even try? I got halfway. <laughs> okay. All right. One more. Oh, oh that, that was it. So, so that's short-term memory. So we store information for a limited time uh, while manipulating the information. The storage uh, for capacity, we have about five to nine items. So five to nine pieces of information. You can remember the magic number seven. Uh, also, three to five for young adults because their brain is not as developed as us. Uh, how you can remember the magic number seven will be the digit for your phone number. I think seven numbers, right? Yeah, what about the area code? Yeah, so I think that's why they had seven numbers uh, in the beginning when they designed it. Well, according to Another psychologist, I don't know if where he got the information, but that's how you can remember it, the measure set, uh, number seven. So the items could be numbers, letters, words, sentences, etc. So any information. The duration is about 12 to 13 seconds without rehearsal. Now if I ask you to remember the numbers that I just showed you, it's going to be very hard, right? Even for the three-digit number. I forgot the first one already. Yeah, so uh, without rehearsal, the duration is pretty short. Oh, so here is an uh, uh, example of the Nemo. I forgot her name. Doria. Doria, yeah. Uh, that's her symptom. Uh, she can't remember for the short term memory. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, it's a disorder. So, demonstration. Uh, how much time do we have left? Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, let's see if we can do this. So I'm going to show you a series of number. Without writing them down, uh, remember as many as you can. Uh, for the right side of the room, close your eyes. Uh, you guys ready? Okay, and write down uh, what you remember. Okay, uh, for right side of the classroom, open your eyes. Once you finish writing down, you can close your eyes. And 
Man, you guys get ready. I'll show you the numbers. Try to remember it. Okay, now write down what you remember. And you guys can open your eyes now. Alright. So what do you remember? I can remember the first and the last one. Okay. Uh, what about you guys? Yeah, how many? Six, maybe seven. Six, maybe seven. Seven or eight. Okay. Five-ish. What about you guys? Seven. Seven? Seven? So the average, it seems like it's a little bit more here, right? I'm going to show you why. So this is how they remember it, single digit number. And this is how you guys remember it, in chunks. And this is called chunking. Uh, this is where we organize information into meaningful groupings. For example, if I ask you to remember this uh, letters, it might be difficult compared to this. Oh, well, right. So we can also create higher order chunks. So we can create chunks of chunks, mm -hmm. like DNA and FBI will be a chunk. Uh, TNT and IRS will be a chunk. Okay, so you, you get the idea, right? Okay. So working memory, this is when you do things to what is in your short-term memory. There, there's some overlapping. I'm going to explain what this means. So this is very important for our reasoning and decision making. For example, working memory is something like uh, you holding a person's address in mind while listening to instructions about how to get there. So it's a little bit higher processing than short-term memory you're using that information instead of just trying to rehearse it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Another example would be listening to a series of events in a story while trying to understand what the story is about. And so you get those information in a story, but you're also trying to figure out the whole picture. You're using that information. All right. So your information moves to long-term memory with attention or rehearsal or both. Got one more minute for a question. Good? Okay, that's it. And uh, we will get the groups ready and we will notify you when the groups is ready. Um, and make sure you start early for the group projects. You can take a look at the instruction first, maybe uh, find the interesting topic that you want to do in a group. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.